Hello, uh, welcome to the second lecture of uh, this module, Micromechanics of Lamina. In our last lecture, we have discussed the importance of uh, studying micromechanics of lamina and its objectives, then uh, different uh, important terminologies used in micromechanics of lamina. We have also uh, discussed different approaches in micromechanics of lamina and uh, then uh, we uh, have discussed the determination of uh, lamina engineering constants using uh, uh, mechanics of material approach. So, in continuation to that in the last class uh, we have discussed the determination of longitudinal Young's modulus and uh, transverse uh, Young's modulus. So, in continuation to that today we shall discuss the determination of other uh, two engineering constants namely the Poisson's ratio and uh, shear modulus using mechanics of material approach. We will also have a uh, detailed discussion on the mechanics of material approach in determination of all these engineering constants in today's lecture. Now, determination of uh, major portions ratio, uh, I mean in, in this with respect to lamina, uh, you know that uh, there could be portions ratio could be defined uh, in two ways. One is a uh, major portion ratio nu 1 2, another is minor portions ratio nu 2 1. Uh, basically, if you consider a lamina which is suppose loaded in principal material direction 1 and because of uh, this load along 1, suppose it is a uniaxial tensile load along 1, what is the strain along transverse direction 2 that is decided by portions ratio nu 1 2 which is nothing but a ratio of the transverse strain ratio of transverse strain epsilon 2 by longitudinal strain epsilon 1 when only sigma 1 is acting all other stresses are 0 sigma 2 tau 1 2 is 0. So, this is nu 1 2 that means ratio of the transverse strain epsilon 2 to epsilon 1 when uh, only sigma 1 is applied along 1 and other, all other stresses are 0. Similarly, we can have uh, suppose you have a lamina where it is actually loaded along 2 and because of the portions effect there will be deformation along 1. That means, in this case only sigma 2 is applied and other stresses are 0. That means, sigma 1 and tau 1 2 are 0. So, the portions ratio here is defined as nu 2 1 is nothing but the ratio of epsilon 1 to epsilon 2. Okay. So, this nu 1 2 is uh, defined as the major portions ratio and nu 2 1 is defined as the minor portions ratio and many times actually nu 1 2 is defined simply as the is, is, is referred to as portions ratio and nu 2 1 is the minor portions ratio. Now, in determination of uh, this major portion ratio, portions ratio using uh, mechanics of material approach, we take the same R v which we have uh, used for determination of longitudinal Young's modulus. Here also we apply a load along 1, okay. we apply a load along the material direction 1, but we study the deformation along 2 which is the Poisson's effect. Okay. Suppose due to load along 1, suppose the deformation in the direction 2 which is because of the Poisson's effect are delta C T, T transverse transverse delta F T and delta M T are the deformations of the composite fiber and the matrix along 2 because of load acting along 1. Okay. And similarly, the strains along direction 2 are epsilon C T for composite that means for the lamina, epsilon F T for the fiber, epsilon M T for the 
matrix. So, because of the load applied along 1, the strains along direction 2 are given by epsilon ct, epsilon ft and epsilon mt. Okay. And suppose the longitudinal strain because the load is applied along 1. So, therefore, there will be strains along 1 which is epsilon cl which is the longitudinal strain along 1, epsilon fl and epsilon ml are the uh, longitudinal strains in the uh, composite fiber and the matrix respectively. Therefore, the strains in the transverse direction could be uh, by definition of strain it is the change in length per unit length. Therefore, along direction 2 for the composite it is delta C t by the initial length along 2 that is T c. Similarly, epsilon f t is delta f t divided by the initial length of the fiber along 2 and similarly, the transverse strain along 2 for the matrix is delta m t by T m. Now, suppose the Poisson's ratio of the composite fiber and the matrix are mu c, u f and mu m respectively. Okay. Therefore, by we could relate the transverse strain to the longitudinal strain by definitions of Poisson's ratio. Therefore, Poisson's ratio of the composite mu c is nothing but ratio of the transverse strain in the composite that is epsilon c t by epsilon c l. Similarly, the Poisson's ratio of the fiber and the Poisson's ratio of the matrix could be as well defined by the uh, corresponding ratios of the transverse strain to the longitudinal strain on when the load is applied along 1 only. Okay. Now, if you remember from the uh, condition of perfect bonding for this R v, the strain in the longitudinal direction in the composite fiber and the matrix is same. We, we have assumed this in the case of determination of uh, longitudinal Young's modulus also. So, since it is loaded along direction 1, therefore, the strain for the fiber matrix and the composite is same along direction 1. Therefore, the longitudinal strain epsilon C l, epsilon F l and epsilon M l are equal. Okay. Now, if you look at what happens, suppose we are only drawing the 1 2 plane. Suppose this is the fiber and the rest is matrix and this is actually loaded in this direction and because of this suppose I am exerting it will not be that much this is the deformed shape. That means, it is extended along direction 1 and it is contracted along direction 2 because of the Poisson's effect. Okay. Now, this is nothing but the change in length of that fiber delta f and this is nothing but the change in length of the matrix delta m. Therefore, the total change in length of the composite delta c in the transverse direction is nothing but delta c is equal to delta f t plus delta m t. You can see clearly from this figure. Okay. Now, we have the relationship uh, by definition of strain. Therefore, we can write this transverse deformation in terms of the transverse strain and the initial thickness. So, this is we have seen already. Therefore, epsilon t is T c epsilon c in, uh, t into T c is nothing but delta c t. Similarly, the transverse strain of the fiber multiplied by the initial thickness is nothing but the transverse deformation and same is true for the matrix. Uh, in short, we could write this that epsilon t is delta t by t for co fiber co uh, composite fiber as well as matrix. Okay. Now, already we have seen that uh, by uh, the transverse strain could be related to the longitudinal strain by Poisson's ratio. Therefore, using this uh, in uh, using this in this equation, we can write that uh, epsilon C L T C multiplied by nu C, which is nothing but uh, I mean epsilon uh, C T is the transverse strain is nothing but uh, Poisson's ratio into the longitudinal strain of course, with negative sign. Similarly, for the fiber and for the matrix. Okay. So, Again, uh, because the longitudinal strain is same for the fiber matrix and the composite, because it is actually loaded along direction 1 and from the condition of perfect bonding. Therefore, using this we get nu c t c is equal to nu f t f plus mu m t m. Okay. 
Now, taking note of the fact that for the R view, you have considered that T f by T c actually represents the volume fraction V f and T m by T c also represents the volume fraction V m. Therefore, we can write that the portions ratio uh, mu c is equal to mu f V f plus mu m V m. Now, what is mu c? Mu c is the portions ratio of the lamina when the stress is applied along 1 and all other stresses are 0 and because of that there is a transverse deformation along 2. Therefore, this mu c is nothing but mu 1 2. So, you could write mu 1 2 is equal to mu f v f plus mu m v m. This is similar to what we uh, obtained for the longitudinal Young's modulus of a lamina u 1 is equal to e f v f plus e m v m. Okay. Uh, now, in the beginning we discussed that portions ratio could be defined in two ways for a lamina. One is major portions ratio which we have just now uh, developed, uh, we, have, we have developed a relation just now mu 1 2 is equal to mu f v f plus mu m v m. What about the minor portions ratio? Once we know this, we can if you remember there is a reciprocal relations for the re, uh, major portions ratio mu 1 2 by u 1 is equal to nu 2 1 by e 2. Therefore, nu 2 1 is equal to nu 1 2 e 2 by e 1. So, since we know e 2 e 1 knowing nu 1 2 we can find out nu 2 and we have already discussed in our macro mechanical analysis that nu 1 2 and nu 2 1 are dependent on each other and they are related by E 2 by E 1 or E 1 by E 2 which is sometimes also called an isotropic ratio. Okay. So, you could clearly see that the major portions ratio mu 1 2 is influenced by the portions ratio of the matrix and portions ratio of the fiber as well as their volume fraction. Okay. Next we will discuss the determination of uh, in plane shear modulus, okay. determination of in plane shear modulus of a lamina. Uh, in this case again we consider the same R V, but it is now subjected to pure in plane shear tau 1 2. That means, it is subjected to only pure shear tau 1 2 and no other stresses. Okay. So, suppose because of this uh, in plane shear, the shear deformation in the composite fiber and the matrix respectively are delta C, delta F, delta M. Please note that suppose you have a I am drawing only the 1 2 plane. Okay. Suppose this is this is 1, this is 2. If it is subjected to pure shear, this is how the deformed shape will be and this is nothing but the shear deformation. Okay. So, suppose the shear deformation for the composite fiber and the matrix are denoted by delta C, delta F and delta M and the shear strains in the composite fiber and matrix are denoted by gamma C, gamma F and gamma M and it is subjected to pure uh, in plane shear tau 1 2. Suppose tau C, tau F and tau M are the shear stresses in the composite fiber and the matrix respectively. Of course, in this case it is subjected to uh, pure in plane shear therefore, uh, it is the shear stress will be same in all this and suppose G C, G F capital G C, G F and G M are the shear moduli of the composite fiber and the matrix respectively. Okay. Now, using the definition of shear strain, how shear strain is defined? Suppose in this case as I uh, suppose at a point suppose this is delta and this is t. Okay. So, the shear strain which is nothing but the ten of this angle is nothing but perpendicular by base delta by t okay. because for small theta ten theta is equal to theta. So, this is how the shear strain is defined. So, shear strain for the composite is related to the shear deformation and the initial thickness t as this okay. as delta c is equal to gamma c into t c. Okay. 
and uh, similarly shear stress in the fiber because we have the relationship uh, like suppose the shear stress in the composite is nothing but actually delta C by T C. Similarly, shear stress shear strain in the fiber is nothing but gamma F is equal to shear deformation of the fiber divided by the initial thickness. Similarly, that of the matrix is. So, using these relations we could write the shear deformation in terms of the corresponding shear strains and the initial thickness. Okay. Also, uh, because for all our analysis we have assumed that the fiber matrix and the composites obey the Hooke's law that is linearly elastic. Similarly, in the case of pure shear also stress by strain is given uh, is, uh, is the shear modulus. Okay. So, this is the, uh, the assumption of Hooke's law of linear elasticity. Okay. Now, as I have uh, already discussed that in this case because it is subjected to in this case this is subjected to pure shear it is subjected to uh, pure shear tau 1 2. So, both fiber matrix and the composite actually experience the same shear stress. Okay. Therefore, tau c is equal to tau f is equal to tau m which is nothing but tau 1 2. Okay. Now, total shear deformation is nothing but the shear deformation of the fiber plus shear deformation of the matrix. Suppose again if we draw the 1 2 plane and see how the shear deformation actually takes place. Suppose this is the fiber and this is the matrix and total is the composite. Therefore, say this is the shear deformation of the fiber delta F and this is the shear deformation of the matrix delta M. Depending upon the shear modulus for the same shear stress the shear strain will be different therefore, shear de deformation will be different. So, therefore, the total shear deformation delta C is nothing but the shear deformation of the fiber plus shear deformation of the matrix. Okay. So, this is what is written here the shear deformation delta C of the composite is nothing but shear deformation of the fiber plus shear deformation of the matrix. Now, using the definition of shear strain we could write the shear deformation in terms of initial thickness for the composite fiber and the matrix and this is what it is. Uh, and then using the using the linear elasticity assumptions that means, the stress by strain is nothing but the shear modulus G C, uh, therefore, we can write this shear strain gamma c is equal to tau c by g c gamma f is equal to tau f by g f and gamma m is equal to tau m by g m. Okay. So, because uh, just now we have discussed that it is subjected to pure in plane shear therefore, the shear stress is experienced by the uh, fiber and the matrix is same therefore, tau c tau f and tau m are same. So, using this we get this T c by G c is equal to T f by G f plus T m by G m. Therefore, dividing both sides by T c we get this relationship 1 by G c is equal to 1 by G f T f by T c 1 by G m T m by T c. Now, taking note of the fact that for this R v T f by T c that means, the ratio of the thickness of the fiber to the thickness of the composite actually represents the uh, volume fraction. Similarly, T m by T c represents V m. So, 1 by G c is V f by G f plus V m plus V m by G m. Okay. Now, G c in this case is nothing but the in plane shear modulus G 1 2. Therefore, we get the relation 1 by G 1 2 is equal to V f plus G f plus V m by G m. So, it is similar to transverse Young's modulus of the lamina. The relation is similar to what we obtained for E 2. If you remember uh, E 2 was having the similar relationship 1 by E 2 is equal to V f by E f plus V m by E m. So, here also uh, uh, it is quite clear that uh, the shear modulus of the lamina is actually decided by the corresponding shear modulus of the fiber and the matrix and their, their relative proportion. Okay. So, now uh, we have obtained uh, using me mechanics of material approach we have obtained the relationship between the uh, relationship between the 
composite modulus in terms of uh, with the uh, modulus of the fiber and the matrix and the relative proportions. So, say for I mean for longitudinal Young's modulus we obtain E 1 is equal to E f V f plus E m V m for transverse Young's modulus E 2 we obtain V f by E f plus V m by E m is equal to 1 by E 2. Please note that this is all for a unidirectional lamina where this 1, 2 are the principal material direction, 1 is the longitudinal direction, 2 is the transverse direction. Okay. Similarly, we obtain for the Poisson's ratio of the lamina in terms of the Poisson's ratios of the fiber and the matrix and the relative proportions that means V f and V m. Please note that uh, V f and V m are sorry V f is equal to 1 minus V m okay. they are dependent. Okay. Uh, similarly, we also obtained uh, for uh, shear modulus uh, just now we have seen that they are also related uh, shear modulus of the composite in terms of the shear modulus of the fiber and the matrix and the relative proportions. Now, having understood this we also clearly stated the assumptions that were made to develop these relationships like one is fiber matrix and composites are all uh, obey Hooke's law linearly elastic fibers are uh, uniform uh, uniform dimensions un uniform diameter equally spaced okay and uh, the uh, there is no void perfect bonding so under all those assumptions i think we have listed all those assumptions we have obtained those relationship now it's important that we understand how accurately these predictions uh, how accurately this mechanics of material approach could actually predict the composite modulus in terms of the uh, modulus of the fiber and the matrix okay so let us uh, start with uh, let us start with the young's modulus longitudinal young's modulus okay let us start with uh, the longitudinal young's modulus e1 so we have obtained that e1 is equal to ef vf plus em vm so why do we add fibers okay suppose in a matrix if we add fibers naturally we would like to see that the stiffness increases okay that is the idea of because fiber stiffness are far higher compared to that of the matrix therefore addition of fiber the matrix the stiffness increases let us see how the fiber properties actually influence that say we can write this as e1 by em is equal to ef by em pf plus pm this is equal to ef by em vf plus vm we could write 1 minus vf therefore which implies e1 by em is equal to ef by em minus 1 into vf plus 1 okay e1 is the longitudinal young's modulus of the lamina e1 is the longitudinal young's modulus of the lamina okay uh, now suppose uh, an em and ef are the uh, young's modulus of the fiber and the matrix respectively suppose uh, ef by em is equal to 10 say generally the fiber modulus is higher compared to that of the matrix okay 
Then in such a case, if suppose V f is equal to 10 percent, suppose we, uh, uh, we, had, we had 10 percent fiber and 90 percent matrix, then what happens? That leads to E 1 by E m becomes uh, 10 minus 1 into V f is 0 0.1 plus 1 that means uh, 0 0.9 1.9. That means uh, adding 10 percent fiber leads to uh, 1.9 times increase in the matrix in the modulus of the compos composite uh, compared to the matrix modulus. Suppose the matrix modulus is 1 then if we add only 10 percent fibers of course, this is for E f by E m when the fibers Young's modulus is 10 times that of the matrix. So, the composite modulus becomes 1.9 that means adding only 10 percent fiber leads to 90 percent increase in the uh, Young's modulus. Okay. Similarly, suppose uh, if V f is equal to 20 percent that leads to U 1 by E m is equal to uh, 1.9 it is equal to 10 minus 1 9 into 0 0.1.2.8 okay so increasing the volume fraction by two fold u1 by em is also increased from 1.9 to 2.8 okay similarly if you use volume fraction as 50% then e1 by em becomes 5.5. Uh, so, we could see that as we increase the volume fraction of the fiber for a given E f by E m, the composite longitudinal Young's modulus also increases almost by the same order, okay? almost by the same order. Now, suppose for a given V f, suppose for a given V f, say V f is equal to say 20 percent, if we increase suppose E f by E m to 20, it implies that uh, E 1 by E m, E 1 by E m becomes 19 into 0 0.2, 3.8 plus 1. Okay. So, uh, for a given volume fraction, if uh, E f by E m is doubled. Now, compare these two. If E f by E m is doubled, it increases from 2.8 to 4.8. So, what we uh, observe is that as V f increases, it has significant effect on the increase longitudinal Young's modulus. And for a given V f, as E f by E m increases, there is a significant increase in the longitudinal Young's modulus. Okay. So, the fibers both in terms of its modulus as well as in terms of its uh, presence that means, the, the volume fraction actually significantly influences E 1 and therefore, this E 1 is actually a fiber dominated property. Okay. So, E 1 uh, is a fiber dominated property. So, suppose next uh, we, we try to understand uh, what happens if uh, when we add the fiber in terms of the load carrying capacity as well as uh, how the addition of fibers actually we understood now that addition of fibers actually influence the uh, longitudinal Young's modulus. Uh, let us see how the fiber behavior and matrix behavior I mean in terms of stress strain relationship actually influences the stress strain behavior of a composite. Okay. So, again we, we consider uh, suppose this is the lamina this is the principal material direction 1 this is 2. So, suppose uh, a total load applied is F c in direction 1 is shared by 
the fiber and the matrix. We have done that in our when we try to deduce the longitudinal Young's modulus using mechanics of material approach. Therefore, this is nothing but sigma C A C, where A C is the cross section area of the composite is equal to sigma f a f. Sigma f is the stress in the composite, f is the cross section area and sigma m a m. Okay. Therefore, if we divide both side by a c, sigma c that means, the stress in the composite uh, is equal to sigma f a f by a c is nothing but v f for the r v we have considered we have discussed that and sigma m v m. So, we have the stresses stress along direction 1 in the composite in terms of the stress in the fiber and stress in the matrix and the relative volumes. Now, suppose I mean relative proportions the volume fractions. Suppose uh, we have the stress strain relationship for fiber this straight line okay even though i could not write straight line this is a straight line this is the stress strain relationship for fiber and suppose say the stress strain relationship for matrix is this again this is also straight line both following hooke's law okay this is for this is for fiber and this is for matrix Now, for a given volume fraction and at a given strain, suppose at a given strain, at a given strain epsilon c, okay, we know what is sigma c. So, for a given from the matrix stress strain curve, for a given strain say at epsilon c we know what is sigma m that is the matrix stress. For the same strain epsilon c we know what is sigma f. Therefore, knowing the volume fraction we also know what is sigma c that means, the stress in the composite at that strain therefore, we get this point. Okay. We get this point. Similarly, for any other point we can find out that knowing the matrix strain matrix stress and the stress in the fiber we could find out what is the stress in the composite therefore we could actually draw the composite stress strain curve okay so this is the uh, we could obtain the composite stress strain curve using the matrix stress strain curve and the fiber stress strain curve uh, this is nothing but sigma c is equal to sigma f v f plus sigma m v m. Okay. So, we could obtain the composite stress strain curve. So, using this relation okay, we could obtain the composite stress strain curve from the stress strain curve of the fiber and the stress strain curve of the matrix. Now, uh, in this uh, in the micro mechanics model in the uh, micro mechanics approach in using mechanics of material uh, approach uh, while determining determining E1 that is the longitudinal Young's modulus, we assume that uh, the matrix and the fiber behaves linearly. I mean, behaves linearly elastic. Okay, obeys Hooke's law. Now, suppose the matrix does not obey Hooke's law. I mean, suppose the matrix is non-linear. Suppose it is like this. Okay, then what happens? See, in this, we still did not put the assumptions of uh, linearity only when we write the stresses in terms of strains and Young's modulus we put the assumptions of linearity. Now, in this in this expression the uh, assumption of linearity is still not there therefore, we can still use suppose this this is the matrix stress strain curve which is nonlinear. we can still use to obtain the stress strain curve for the composite using the matrix and the fiber only thing is if this is nonlinear this will also be the composite the uh, the curve for the composite stress strain will also be nonlinear okay 
therefore, we can still obtain this, but knowing that uh, E f is far greater than E m. Okay. Therefore, even though I have shown here the nonlinearity like this, it will it is exerted, it will not be that much. So, the influence of the nonlinearity of the polymer uh, of the matrix will not be significant in determination of the stress strain curve of the composite. Okay. Also, at higher volume fraction it is dominated by the fiber. Therefore, uh, E m or, or stress strain nonlinearity of matrix does not cause significant error in E 1, especially at high volume fraction. Okay. Therefore, many times it is not considered, okay. but fiber mostly I mean fiber actually behaves like linear till its failure, but matrix uh, may behave non-linearly, but uh, for the, the uh, it does not have much influence on the determination of E 1 using mechanics of material approach. Okay. The next thing is the load share. So, F c is equal to F f plus F m. Uh, therefore, we can write uh, this is uh, uh, therefore, we, we know that uh, F f by F m that means, the ratio of the load shared by the fiber to that of the uh, shared by the matrix is nothing but sigma f a f sigma m a m and this could be written as e f by e m p f by v m because we can write sigma f is equal to epsilon f into e f and sigma m is equal to epsilon m into e m and because of the perfect bonding epsilon f and epsilon m are same. So, therefore, we can write this and a f by a m we can write this as e f e m v f v m. Therefore, we can see that for uh, suppose we take uh, we take E f by E m is equal to 10. Okay. And say V f is equal to 10 percent. Uh, we could see that addition of 10 percent of fiber actually leads to 50 percent almost 50 percent of the load shared by fiber. Okay. Therefore, it is significant I mean for a given uh, uh, ratio of E f by M, E f is generally higher much higher compared to that of the matrix modulus. Therefore, for say for 10 we could see that if we put volume fraction as 10 percent that that shows that the load shared by the fiber is almost 50 percent. Okay. If you plot this, if we plot this uh, the the volume fraction versus uh, F f by F m so this is not to scale but okay so, this is this is with increasing E f by E m so, 2 5 like this. Okay. So, for a given uh, as volume fraction increases the load share of the fiber increases for a given volume fraction as E f by E m increases 
the load share also increases. Therefore, uh, what you could see for E1 that longitudinal Young's modulus is actually a fiber dominated property and it is observed that this E1 predicted actually E1 by uh, actually agrees well with experimental results. Okay. It is observed that this uh, they agree well with the experimental observations. Uh, next up uh, uh, let us see about E2. Okay. E2. Let us see the mechanics of material approach determination of E2 and we know that we obtain this 1 by E2 is equal to V f by E f plus V m by E m which implies E 2 is equal to E m E f E m E f by V f E m plus V m E f. Okay. Now, if you plot this uh, if we plot this E 2 by E m as a function of V f, if we plot this similar to what we have done for E 1, E 2 by E f as a function of V f. So, this is 1. And uh, of course, for Vf is equal to one, this becomes Ef by Em. Depending upon the values of Ef by Em, suppose Ef by Em is ten, then this will be equal to ten. Okay. So what we could see is that this is not to scale. Okay. What we could see that uh, that uh, suppose if we want to find out that for 50 percent volume fraction suppose. Suppose what happens uh, if for a given uh, suppose what happens if V f is 50 percent for a given E f by E m is equal to say 10. Okay. Suppose uh, what happens to that? Okay. We could see that uh, if we have suppose fiber to matrix uh, modulus ratio as 10 and suppose V f is 50 percent, this leads to E 2 by E m. That means, adding 50 percent volume uh, 50 percent fiber leads to increase in uh, the matrix modulus only by 2 times. Now, if you compare the, this with uh, longitudinal Young's modulus, I mean adding 10 percent uh, fiber volume fraction leads to adding 10 percent fiber volume fraction leads to almost 90 percent increase in the matrix Young's modulus. Okay. So, here uh, E f does not have much influence, does not have much influence. on E 2. Okay. To, to get a suppose E 2 by E m to achieve a E 2 by E m say 5, you need almost 90 percent volume fraction which is impractical. We have discussed in our last class that 90 percent volume fraction is not achievable in that case there will be not much space left for weighting of the fibers that might lead to uh, because the fibers will touch each other and therefore there may be uh, imperfect uh, adhesion between the fiber and the matrix there may be voids. Okay. Therefore, uh, this uh, transverse Young's modulus is not influenced by the presence of the matrix uh, presence of the fiber uh, I mean 
not much influenced by modulus of the fiber as well as the volume fraction of the fiber. Okay. And this transverse Young's modulus also it is observed E 2 the mechanics of material approach the expressions for E 2 is does not agree well does not agree with experimental results okay it's actually a matrix dominated property it is not influenced by the fiber uh, properties now the reason for this is see in our uh, representative volume element we have actually assume that the fibers in the thickness directions are regularly spaced like this okay and we have taken a particular layer of fiber and we made the representative volume element further simplified like this okay see this is direction 1 okay this is direction 1 this is direction 2 and we assumed that sigma 2 that means the stress in the composite in direction 2 is equal to sigma f is equal to sigma m. This is fine as long as it is like this, but in actual uh, case the fibers will be randomly spaced and it is not uh, stacked uh, as it is shown here. Okay. Therefore, actually the load in the direction 2 is the stress is not uniform, but it is shared. Suppose this is the fiber and this is the matrix. Therefore, the stress in the composite is not the stress in the matrix and stress in the fiber. It is actually shared. That is the reason for the discrepancy. Actual case it is like this. And the uh, Second uh, reason is there is a mismatch in Poisson's ratio of the fiber and the matrix. We have discussed that earlier also. So, because of this what happens? There is a transverse stress there is a transverse stress okay because the uh, uh, portions ratio in the fiber and the matrix are different. Therefore, they will suppose it is uh, subjected to load along direction 2, then there will be um, deformation in direction 1, which will not be equal for uh, fiber and the matrix. So, therefore, there will be stresses induced in the fiber and the matrix. So, that is another reason uh, which is not taken into account in this uh, simplified RV. Therefore, the transverse Young's modulus which is obtained by the, the expression for transfer the Young's modulus does not actually predict uh, results accurately and it does not match with the experimental observations. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the E 1 agrees well with the experimental observations. Okay. Uh, same is the reason that even G 1 2 which is a matrix dominated property actually does not agree well does not agree with the same reasons could be attributed for G 1 to what we have just now discussed for E 2. Uh, so, what we understood is that uh, the mechanics of material approach actually uh, gives us simplified uh, uh, simple relations where the modulus of the composite could be obtained from the corresponding moduli of the fiber and the matrix and the relative proportions. However, accepting the longitudinal uh, Young's modulus that is E 1, uh, the longitudinal Young's modulus E 1 actually agrees well with the uh, uh, experimental observations, but the matrix dominated property like transverse Young's modulus E 2 and the shear modulus G 1 2 actually do not agree with the experimental results. There are deviations when the experimental observations are made for this 
for a lamina and it was when uh, those experimental observations are compared with the E 2 and G 1 2 predicted by the mechanics of metal approach and the reasons are uh, we have just now discussed it is uh, because it is a matrix dominated property and uh, we make some simplified assumptions which do not go well. Okay. So, in summarizing that uh, this mechanics of material approach could provide us a simplified uh, relationship for E 1, E 2, nu 1, 2 and G 1, 2. However, the predictions of E 2 and G 1, 2 by mechanics of material approach do not uh, agree with the experimental observations. So, I will stop here today. Thank you.